before I start, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I have worked in industry for about 30 years. Uh, people tell me I don't look that old. I'm quite old. Um, and I moved back to India about eight years back after having worked in MNCs, uh, Eastman Kodak Company, HP, Intel. I started my career in India with Wipro and Infosys doing UX and customer-centric design even before I knew that that is what it is called. And last five years, I moved out from MNC and I joined Srishti as a director of their innovation lab. And over the multiple years of experience, I've been thinking, what are we doing? Are we doing the UX in the right way? So today I'm going to talk about something which may not be directly relevant to what you guys do in companies today, but I want to just give leave some of my thoughts of where the future is and what could you be thinking about. Whether you're working in a company from a strategy perspective or you start your own startup and so on. So that's where that's what this talk is about. And you cannot talk about future without thinking what happened, what's the past. And so I'm going to flash history of UX, and most of you may know this, as early as 5th century BC, user experience design started. I mean, it was more of how do you design for humans, so starting from uh, ancient Greece, ergonomics of tools, to Taylorism, human uh, tools design. Am I in the middle here? I'm going to move this, this side. Yes, we had Taylorist view of human tool interaction to Toyota production system to Dreyfus designing schools, designing for people, to Xerox R&D to all the way up to today with iPhone and internet revolution. However, each of these frameworks and principles have always used, it's a very people-centric, user-centric, individual-centric approach where you look at emotions and attitudes of a particular product, system, or service. And depending upon which framework you look at, I mean, if it was a Tayloristic view, you would have looked at utility, ease of use, and efficiency. And all the way to uh, Tim Kelly's mode of three-circle model, you would look at practical, experiential. If you look at Dom Norman's emotional design, you would look at affective, and so on. But these are the things that have been covered. Practical, experiential, meaningful, valuable, utility, and so on. These frameworks have helped us create efficient, fast, desirable, and to a certain extent viable user experiences of products and services. However, in doing so, it has ignored a significant role that we designers can play in actually figuring out, can we become a change agent? Are we designing something for more individualist con consumption? Is it going to make an impact on the world? And can we even create an early warning system? Look at what has happened with mobile phone designs. Amazing amount of user experiences. However, we have forgotten the ethics of using a mobile interface. We have forgotten the ethics of social communication. I have seen friends sitting at the dinner table, not talking to each other, communicating with each other through messages. And is that what we want as a future? Yeah, and so that's what this talk is about. This individualistic frameworks has created multiple effects. One of that, and this is a report by McKinsey and Company in February 2015, our debt has increased to $57 trillion, and it's since 2007. And you can say that, oh, that debt is including financial, government, corporate, but look at just the household debt that has created this individualistic consumer, consumer behavior-based UX development and product development. From 33 trillion, it has gone to 40 trillion. It's a huge impact. So we are creating society which is going in debt. Sorry. Across sectors and geographies, this individualistic behavior and UX is creating problems. China's debt is soaring. Shadow banking has grown 36%. Shadow banking is a secondary banking. It's not legal banking. It's illegal banking. Households are borrowing more. And government debt is, debt is going and hitting the roof. 
e-waste generated by, again, this type of UX development and product development across the board is getting into millions of tons of e-wastage. Obviously, the top 10 are the developed countries. Yeah? And this is a report by Forbes, April 2015. But we are not way back. We are kind of creating, this is a slide that is got from what is happening in Bangalore. 8 million Bangaloreans, according to 2011 census, and we are creating almost 0.1 million tons of plastic yearly, along with a lot of e-waste. Is this the world that we want to create as UX designers? Is the question that each of us need to ask. It may not be directly relevant to the UI that we create today. However, just want to seed that in your minds. Is that what we want to be as designers? Some changes are happening. And it's interesting, this report is uh, by Goldman Sachs, and it kind of covers the millennials uh, in the US. Millennials is this generation which was born between 1980 and 2000. So the oldest millennium, millennials are about 34, 33, 34 years old. 92 million of those uh, in US. And it's interesting, it applies to many parts of the world. I'm just going to show a case study from US. And what has happened is some of the behaviors are changing for these millennials, partly because they believe that change is needed to have a sustainable future, but partly it's also because of the situations that they are going through. And one of the situations that has happened is they're coming out of their postgraduate education with a huge loan on their head. Over the last 10 years, it has grown from $10,000 to $20,000. The other thing that has happened is the disposable income available to these millennials is much lower than what it was. And you can see the trend from 2000 to 2012. Now these two things and their own passion has created some, in has created some interesting behavioral changes. You don't want that to happen just because your financial system goes down. You don't want your behaviors to change. As a person, can I think that my behavior is not the right behavior for this planet to survive? Or Maybe someday we will all have to sit in a rocket and go to Mars. And that technology is coming, so not to worry there, I guess. And these new behaviors in the millennials are very interesting. If you look at the hierarchy of needs, 15% of the millennials have said that buying a TV, a big screen TV, is extremely important. So 85% of this generation is saying that buying a TV is not necessarily important for them. Or I don't want it. And this applies to luxury bags, applies to cell phones, high-end cell phones, houses, and so on. The other thing that has happened, oops, sorry, I guess I told you I'm getting old. <laughs> um, with less to spend, they're pushing their marriages, commitment to marriage, and buying houses as far as possible. And this is what has happened, 1998 to 2012. See how it has gone down? Renters in this generation has gone from 52% to 60%. More and more people are renting. What does that tell you? There are people who have kind of looked at uh, Uber has come on, Airbnb, shared business models are growing. And some of it is relevant to this behavior. Dealing with these transitions, of whatever transitions you look at, actually creates fear. And Isserman, who was an urban planning expert, he said, we, most of us have lost sight of the future and what, how do we want to design for the future? So my stake here is that we need to reframe user experience design. We need to design it with an understanding of social problems. We have to think about users as well as non-users so that if I'm a mobile user, a non-user mo of mobile doesn't get pissed off with what I'm doing. And it has to focus on human values and better present and future for all of us. Most of the UX that has been developed so far is based on Maslow's pyramid type of thinking. Whether you take a five level or a seven level, it's very individualistic. If I want to give your, meet your cognitive needs, then I would specifically approach that and try to meet it as best as possible. And we know it is flawed because it's not necessarily that human beings move in a very, trans, uh, very linear fashion. Your needs, upper level needs, do not get met only when your lower level needs are met. And a good example of that is when we look at into our villages. 
you see DTH penetration substantially higher in villages. However, what saddens me is even when this network is available, nobody has thought that the same network could have been used for un unmet demand seeking programs that connected to ed career advice, employment, and skill development. That is a call that we are, each of us UX designers and designers need to have. Nano, I'm happy that it failed. A lot of people say, told me that it's a very good innovation. And I, to me, it's not. You may have done the user research and said, okay, four people travel on a bike, and that's why let me give them a car. But where's the infrastructure? Where, do, where are we putting these more cars on the road? And a company like Tata Motors, which has all the powers that they could have worked with the government, wouldn't it, have, it be better if they had worked on weaning people off cars and motorbikes and rebranding by cycles and buses, making public transportation and healthy transportation much more sexy so that all of us get off of our cars and get into public. Isn't that a UX designer's job? I think it is. Ayal Sardinan is an architect, and as way early as 1950, he said, think about a bigger impact. Always design a thing by considering it to the next larger context. If somebody asks you to design a chair, think about the room. A room in the house, a house in an environment, an environment in a city plan. And when you think higher, you start realizing that what you are asked to design has a bigger impact. And let me then think about how can I make a difference. And maybe Maslow's pyramid is not the way of looking at it. Manfred Max Neff is an economist, and no wonder a psychologist will think individualistic, economist and sociologist will think about the group. And they look at this model where everything, it's not hierarchical, all these needs are interdependent, and can we then look at this model as a, a conjecture going forward? Terry Irwin, Kosov, and Tonkin Weiss, they're from CMU. They have looked at what is called as transition design framework very interesting framework, which looks at Maxif's needs but goes beyond of how do I make a designer think about the future. LinkedIn has come out with this motivational UX framework. Interestingly enough, about the nine principles, I was happy that at least one is at a higher level which says belonging. And it's not belonging for me, belonging for everybody else. We need different methods. Responsible research and innovation is a call by Horizon 2 2020 in EU, which talks about how can I make societal actors work with me to make a bigger impact? You need fuel, fluid processes, not a linear process, but creative thinking and critical thinking is extremely important. This is going back to Bruce Nossbaum's book about critical thinking. And we need to have an informed but distant approach. I am fed up with this three-circle model, and it's a passe. Tom Kelly did it for a certain reason. But what happens is, as designers, when we are pulled too much into business and engineering, we start thinking like businessmen and engineers. We think quantitative. We don't think about societal impact. We only think about how much money can we make. And my take is that you need to be aware of business and engineering. Let's remove it on this side. Let's put concentration on user and design. We are aware of this. But let's also bring humanities and social sciences in that so that we can actually create bigger impact. Some of the small efforts that we have started at Shrishti is starting new masters, of pro master's programs, which allow me to do this. And also, one of the students is doing a PhD with me. Many of you may know Apala Lahri Chavan, so she is doing a PhD. And there are multiple factors that I just talked about that get incorporated into this. So with that, I will stop. And with a phrase from, it gets contributed to many people, like Robbins, Einstein, Ford, Twain, doesn't matter who said it. But this is what it says. If you always do what you always did,